Well, thank you so much, um, Jose, for the help. Um, thank you all, welcome to the thematic parallel session number four. We will be talking about digital teaching and learning. My name is Aliandra Barletti. I am talking to you from the University of Edinburgh and the, our research group on comparative education and international development. It's a partner of the conference. So we are, myself and my colleagues, we are very happy to be able to help even a little bit in the conference. And we welcome all the speakers who will be talking today. And we also welcome the participants. That was very rude, sorry about that. And um, I have a cat, so if you see something walking here, it's, it's my fault because I, I'm not very, a very good educator of cats. So I apologize in advance if he comes and decides to engage in the session as well. <laughs> so um, we are going to have five presentations today. Please remember to choose the channel that you will be listening to the presentations. We have two channels, one in English, one in Russian. So if you choose one of the channels, you will be getting all the presentations in that one language. And at the end of each presentation, we will have some time for questions. So please write down your questions in the chat and I can pick them up and share with, with our speakers. Right, so um, I think we are ready to start. We have, um, as first speakers, Maya Bliadze and Nino Petviashvili. Ah, I apologize. <laughs> and they will be talking about education and the COVID-19 pandemic. So Maya and Nino, you will have 15 minutes. So we are going to be good with time. And um, the floor is yours. I see you sharing your presentations. And again, I invite our participants, the audience, to write down questions for Maya and Nino in the chat. You can start. Good afternoon. My colleague and me welcome you. We're very good that we have possibility to take part in these conferences. I agree with you, with your proposal at the beginning. We shall enjoy a good Georgian one after this conference. So our topic is very interesting. Education and COVID-19 pandemic that impacted the whole world, impacted all countries, all spheres of life, especially sphere of education. It has changed situation dramatically in sphere of education the world over. And the current situation demanded us in Georgia to change the fundamental principle of traditional education because of this sudden pandemic ministry of education of georgia had to get adapted to new realities and switch entirely to distance learning which was proceeding with problems everybody knows very well that force um, objective of sustainable development of United Nations is aimed at ensuring equality of inclusive education, creation possibility for long, long development of education. Georgia is a small country, but it's very versatile. We have many, many people who live in small villages in the mountains. And when pandemic started, we in Georgia got problems, both for the students and for the teachers. What to do? 
during the first day, um, first week of lockdown, there was a feeling of panic. Uh, very many teachers could not use uh, computer technologies. They did not have possibility to get linked to the internet. There was no possibility to have computer devices or other electronic devices. Initially, it was believed that all existing online resources, different interactive panels, digital centers can make life of the teacher easier. Teacher can make education very interesting for the teachers, but in reality, situation was quite different. It turned out that online education is not easy to acquire. During pandemic, teachers were teaching online, but what was the most painful problem? They didn't have access to technologies and distant learning is impossible if you don't have uh, um, a computer or a telephone. I will continue. I must say that during COVID pandemic, reform of education is going on and it continues even now. Despite COVID, this reform was implemented. It was called model of a new school. It became a considerable step in reforming system of education. The main objective was to create targeted educational environment that provides students knowledge and skills needed in current reality. In the process of this reform, the questions were raised that were especially important during pandemic use of digital technology that was one of the objectives of the reform so when we had to implement reform during pandemic people had different views some people thought that this reform should suspend others believed that reform should be continued so attitude was not uniform Although, um, despite all that, I think that this reform uh, did help to implement the goals set during pandemic. Although um, most teachers and parents had problems because there was a total lockdown. Everything was closed. Uh, learning began uh, online. Parents were also working online from home. And families with many children where parents were working using the computer or other gadget. Uh, children didn't always have technical equipment and learning resources. In the best case, a family has two computers or tablets, but if there are three school children uh, in the family, in parallel with that, mother and father working with computers, these problems could not be resolved. People use different approach. Sometimes they resolved it locally school was provided computers and uh, tablets as a loan um, for temporary use to the families but it could not happen everywhere in the city situation was better but in high mountains villages it was difficult people don't have smartphones they don't have computers there is no internet and for distance learning, you need high speed quality internet. So different methods of attending lessons were used. Some people could get connected through the internet platform that I will discuss later. Some people were using Zoom. You know, a story of uh, a boy from Peru 
there was an example of what was happening in the world over. Same situation was in our country. Uh, a, a boy from Peru, they didn't have electricity and his father um, helped him to uh, get connected from electric power plant. But the story of our Georgian boy was internet uh, connection was very poor and Georgian boy uh, and his family found a place where internet was good. So they put this uh, self-made roof, put the table and he was studying from this place. Uh, of course, the decision was taken that changed routine life of parents, children, uh, parents, uh, social distancing, self-isolation, closure of school. That was a big stress for entire society. You cannot talk about um, all around internet education if there is poor internet or no internet or no technical gadgets so, uh, or people don't have skill. If teachers are not prepared for the new format of learning, this is also a serious problem. Uh, what is happening at offline classroom lesson cannot be transferred entirely in Zoom into in internet. There are numerous drawbacks of distance learning. First, you lose a social element of education because education is not only getting certain knowledge, accumulation of certain knowledge. Uh, it's important for children because children acquire social and communicative skills. For teachers, pandemic was a big stress. Uh, there was a danger of emotional burning out. Why? Because online teaching for teachers means that they worked 24 seven, huge workload. And plus to that, um, it's not only students who are listening to what teachers are saying, but parents. And sometimes I was a witness when grandmas and grandfathers were interfering into internet lesson and criticizing teacher, making remarks for the teacher. And that was difficult for the teachers. They were working not only with students, they had to prove to parents, to grandparents that they are teaching very well and provide quality education in a particular subject. And the question of distance, it's not only sending and receiving tasks, but entire process of connected with a social construction, which should not impact negatively participants. Teachers have to work uh, hard, not only teach, but to learn themselves. Not all teachers were computer literate so well. There were teachers who didn't know how to use computer. And they thought that their lessons were quite good using traditional method. But even such teachers who had skeptical approach to new technology, they were forced to learn computers and uh, overcome the problem. So how to teach children through distance learning, how to resolve all mentioned problems that we discussed now with my colleague. One should define the degree of stress, both of students and teachers and the entire society and differentiate education process that students are not left without particular attention. During coronavirus pandemic, some students were very active in the process of learning. Some got sick and they were lost. Students who were very passive in lessons in classrooms, on the contrary, they were very active online and vice versa. It's difficult to give some uh, intermediary or terminal tests 
sometimes it was impossible to assess education because children were changing. Some children were present at some lesson, at other lessons they were absent because of technical problems or because they were sick. And teachers had to find new format of assessing the knowledge. Maybe in the future, this assessment will be more personalized. Our new school reform includes that when we have individual approach to every pupil, we offer them differentiated methods of learning and more focus is made on assessment of development in the process rather than the final outcome. The state made a lot, Ministry of Education and the House of Teachers that we represent conducted training for teachers. All trainings were switched to online format, training on different areas what teachers needed at that particular moment. Webinars were held, topics of webinars were selected based on the needs and challenges that particular schools had and uh, teaching resources were developed. Electronic resources, they were placed on our platform and transferred to teachers. To say nothing about electronic journal that we have, which contained a lot of publications, a lot of articles devoted to this topic. A huge work has been done to create virtual classes for all grades of government schools. All government school of Georgia switched to Microsoft Teams platform. Profile were created for all teachers, for all pupils, more than 600,000 students and 55,000 teachers have activated their special profile. Uh, virtual classes were activated and they could use these tools placed in um, Microsoft Office 365, that includes Teams and other opportunities. Hybrid learning, which is very important. Well, after distant learning, children started attending school again. Still, possibility was provided both for students and teachers and for parents to get included into this hybrid learning process. Some parents were afraid to let children go to school uh, or some children were sick and they could not attend school. They or they left big cities and moved to small villages to their dachas to um, save themselves from COVID. Then um, opportunity was provided to make electronic request for uh, students and their parents where they can work in parallel online. Although it is an um, additional work I'm loan sorry, for the Nino, teacher. Two minutes is left for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You are finished with the time. I really yes. appreciate it. Thank you for your presentation. I see, but I see. Yeah, thank you very much. It was very interesting. We are um, waiting for questions. Would anyone have a question? Please write in the chat a question for Nino and Maya after their very interesting presentation about the impact in Georgia. Um, while um, we wait a question from the audience, I have a question for you. Oh, there's a question in in Russian, ah, if somebody helps me translate. <laughs> I shall read it, the interpreter will read. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whether, I cannot see the beginning. Ah, yes. Which approaches to organization of distant learning improved organization of distance learning in um, high mountains villages? So thank you for your questions. Uh, different measures were taken, but the state, the Ministry of Education uh, made 
very quickly so-called TV school, where lessons were broadcast on TV and everybody could take part in these lessons. It was especially advantageous for children who live in the high in the mountains, no internet, and the resources were sent to them, uh, to these high mountains villages. They could use uh, these materials and the teachers were working together with the students. More questions? Yes, yeah, so the, the other question that we have comes from Natya Pirashvili. She asks, what was the most challenging during, what was the most challenging aspect during the pandemic and the digital learning in Georgia? I can say, being a representative of the home of teachers. Mm -hmm. difficult, most difficult was to switch from real teaching to digital teaching. Not all teachers were prepared for that. Initially, we thought that it's the same way. Lesson will be just the same as you do it traditionally in the classroom, but it happened to be different and training and retraining of teachers using new methodologies was needed. We changed approach entirely and we uh, offered them the methodology that allowed them uh, to use it in distance learning. We provided them electronic resources, we wrote articles how to conduct electronic lesson better, in which way electronic lesson is different from classroom uh, lesson. That was one of the biggest problems. To say nothing about problem with equipment. I can add only one sentence. We conducted webinars on particular subject, particular disciplines, separately for each discipline, for the teachers teaching particular discipline. For them to learn electronic resources on their discipline, and then they could use it electronic lessons to make them interesting, active, and so on. New resources were provided that they could use it directly at the lesson. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It looks like everybody had to go back to the drawing board, isn't it? All of us had to basically relearn how we did the teaching that we used to do for so many years, but that wouldn't work anymore. Da, da, da. <laughs> so thank you so much to Maya and Nino for the presentation. <laughs> we really thank you for um, the detail, the information that you gave to us coming from Georgia. And now we invite our next speakers, Jung Nietzsche and Reiko Take, who will be Hi, they will be talking about the Australian strategic yeah, partnership. Close the microphone. So, um, um, I think Maya, can you please stop sharing your screen? Or if I know how to do it, I can try to do it. Oh, there you go. Thank you so much. So, Jung and Reiko, you are able to um, uh, share your screen from now on. Right, you have, once again, you have 15 minutes. So as you saw, I'm going to be very evil with time. So thank you. You can, you can start your presentation. I can hear you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I will let Reiko start. So Reiko. Good evening, everybody, uh, well, uh, from the other side of the world. Uh, it's uh, My name is Reiko Take from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or DFAT. Uh, and today we would like to present on the Australian Strategic Partnerships in Remote Education. Uh, next slide, please, Jung. Um, hang on a minute.
So uh, Aspire, so Australian Strategic uh, Partnerships in Remote Education or Aspire um, is uh, one of DFAT's uh, COVID-19 education responses um, and it's designed to build on our many bilateral education programs in our region. So I uh, really enjoyed hearing about uh, high mountain communities in Georgia, but we are going to talk about uh, more tropical uh, areas and uh, Pacific Island countries today. And we really wanted to draw on Australia's uh, long history of uh, delivering remote education domestically. Uh, obviously, you will be aware that Australia is a big country. We have remote communities ourselves, um, and we have been, you know, uh, but famous for School of the Air. So we've been doing remote education for a long time. So we wanted to draw on this experience, but uh, we didn't want it to be Australia pushing our experience and knowledge uh, on our partners uh, in the region. Um, so the initiative is demand driven and responds to the region's uh, requests for support and us adapting Australian uh, knowledge and expertise. Thanks, Jung. Um, so in order to inform our theoretical approach, we conducted a comprehensive literature review looking at historical studies um, on remote learning in Australia, um, as well as internationally. Um, and this was done around uh, the time of the height of the pandemic in 2020. So there was only very um, new and emerging data coming on board um, from the international literature. So what we found was that there were five good practice guides, uh, key principles in effective remote education. And this was consistent across all the different phases um, in various contexts, including um, emergency response, as well as um, recovery and adaptation and long-term education resilience building. Um, we found that the five key principles relate to parental involvement, uh, student engagement was also important, community partnerships played a key role in a successful remote education delivery, um, support for teachers was uh, critical, as well as a focus on inclusion and equity. Um, the research showed that remote schooling offers many opportunities um, as we went along for adapting the way that teaching and learning happens and also for finding additional ways to support teachers and enhance student capability and student well-being. Importantly, all those opportunities focus on the central role of teaching preparedness and teaching practice. What the evidence was most clear about was that technology supplements but does not replace teaching. Thank you, Jung. So uh, we, I'd like to introduce, we had three partnerships that we delivered through the Aspire initiative. And the first one I'd like to introduce is uh, Lao uh, People's Democratic Republic. So we worked with the uh, Department of Teacher Education there and eight of their teacher training colleges uh, to provide teacher professional learning workshops delivered through um, a learning management system. Um, so working with the uh, teacher training lecturers so that they can train their future teachers in delivery of remote education. Um, so the partnership was between uh, Monash College in Australia, which has uh, remote uh, education experts and experience in delivering online courses overseas. Um, and they delivered their uh, training through an a online platform. And I think the nice thing about this partnership was that the participants themselves, the lecturers were able to um, themselves, they, they were able to ex experience digital learning through this partnership. So they had experience of what it would be like to be uh, a student of remote learning. And some of the lessons from this partnership, you can see there. Um, so digital learning in Laos, uh, uh, through this partnership, we learned that it's an opportunity for immersive learning. Uh, it uh, provides uh, opportunities for collaboration, uh, potential to make access to quality education more equitable. So not just during COVID-19 and school lockdown uh, situations, but also in accessing uh, remote students. 
Um, and again, as you mentioned in the research, the, um, the importance of parents and communities, uh, parents and communities in remote learning uh, to make remote learning a success um, was also um, highlighted in the workshops. And the next partnership was uh, with the Masama One Ministry of Education, Sports and Culture. Um, we were really keen to make sure this partnership was uh, with an Australian partner that has experience in education service delivery. So uh, we were keen to make it a government, government to government uh, partnership. And we were fortunate to uh, find a partner in one of our state Department of Education, so Queensland Department of Education, and not just a urban area of, of the state, but um, a regional branch of the Queensland Department of Education. So somewhat had, had a short period of COVID lockdown, school lockdown, um, but uh, in 2019, they also experienced a measles outbreak, a measles epidemic. So they have had uh, several different kinds of school lockdown situations. So they were keen to plan for future disruptions. So some of the lessons learned there, uh, um, a hybrid approach to remote learning is critical to address equity and, and, and access. So in Samoa, only one in 10 uh, families have access to internet or a computer, but 90% of the population has access to a mobile phone. So this provides opportunities for the ministry to deliver remote education content through mobile phones and supplement that with other more accessible means such as radio or TV and also paper-based kits. Um, the next lesson there is uh, again, um, resource provision uh, for upskilling of teachers in digital pe pedagogy. Um, so training teachers in delivering of remote education and again, um, parent engagement uh, was also a critical feature um, to support um, successful remote education. Um, and our third pilot partnership was um, across several countries in the Pacific region, including Fiji, Samoa, Tuvalu and Kiribati. Um, there was actually quite a strong demand from these countries for assistance in the development of digital content that they could use to support remote delivery of the science curriculum. So the Australian National University Centre for the Communication of Science was um, identified to partner with the um, government um, institutions, uh, as well as teaching colleges, universities, and some community organisations across these four countries to build the capacity of teachers um, and lecturers in delivering remote education um, using science um, content. So the training was um, intended to build the participants' capability in remote teaching, um, as well as their online uh, pedagogy and learning design through um, video-based instruction using video uh, digital platforms, um, and as well as social media for outreach and um, home-based learning approaches where digital connection is not possible. Um, as part of this partnership, a regional network was also formed, and this was something that has continued to this day, um, and that's been supported through regional workshops and facilitation uh, with relationship building between all these partners across the Pacific to share their knowledge and exchange ideas, and um, it has become an informal network for teachers and teacher educators to collaborate um, and share their, their latest knowledge and practices relating to remote teaching and learning. Um, some of the key outcomes from this partnership demonstrated the importance of using a localised digital content um, and capacity building of teachers and lecturers um, in the use of digital technology was more successful. However, this can only be done effectively, as has been outlined in other contexts, such as Georgia, that there has been, um, that needs a, an appropriate level of access to equipment and internet connectivity, which still remains a barrier for many parts of the Pacific being so geographically remote. Um, we also found that partnerships with community organisations were very effective. 
This is um, while in Samoa, for example, the partnership between a government um, department with the Ministry of Education was highly successful. We found that in some contexts, working with um, community organisations have proven to be effective in delivering remote education. For example, where the formal education system has been slow to respond when the pandemic first hit, or where um, education might be out of reach for some of the students um, who are living in remote and rural communities. So the use of community partnership models has been successful in order to mobilize um, education quickly and to adapt um, and to provide con continuity of education to these students, particularly for the most disadvantaged. So you might think I've only got five minutes, so I might quickly go through these and then hand over back to you. Um, so these are some common themes across the three partnerships. Uh, all three countries were in quite different situations in terms of COVID and their school lockdown and learning continuity situations. But as you've heard, uh, common themes have been uh, the need for uh, teacher professional development and also, you know, teacher lacking skills in remote learning pedagogy. Um, often in the countries that we work in, basic learning pedagogy is sometimes uh, not as adequate as we'd like it to be. Uh, so on top of this, uh, remote learning pedagogy is an additional challenge. Content development, as you uh, mentioned, was uh, highly in demand. And again, access for all learners, so inclusivity, uh, inclusivity of, uh, of learners, uh, in particularly disadvantaged learners, uh, is a particular priority and a challenge. Um, and of course, opportunities are aligning uh, with existing government responses and policies and resources, uh, teacher standards and training uh, frameworks, and involving parents in the community. Thank you, Yon. Thanks, Reko. So out of all the, um, the experiences that we have gathered across the three partnerships in the Indo-Pacific um, and the common priorities and challenges that's been faced by these countries um, in their response to remote education, we came up with four recommendations that we hope might be able to help inform future responses, um, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but more globally as well. So firstly, um, Technology still remains a barrier for many, many uh, parts of the Indo-Pacific. And so we recommend a combination of high-tech, low-tech and no-tech solutions to support the diversity of the learning context in the Pacific, um, in the Indo-Pacific. And this will include um, students who have access to technology, but who may not have um, the digital skills or the self-regulation to be able to effectively engage uh, with the technology content. Um, secondly, we recommend um, support for teachers uh, is crucial. The literature shows that the modality of teaching, regardless of what it is, does not predict learner achievement positively or negatively. We know that. So through these as, um, Aspire partnerships, we have been able to equip teachers with skills in digital um, pedagogy to be able to deliver more engaging remote learning lessons. Um, thirdly, uh, a focus on equity. We know that the evidence that's now emerging from the global um, uh, research base points to um, a growing disproportionate um, disparity for um, the children who are most disadvantaged and vulnerable. And so we, uh, and these are the, the children who are most likely to drop out of um, the school system altogether and are mo most at risk of not returning when schools reopen. So we are recommending that um, we focus on these student populations and also the involvement of parents and the community as facilitators of home learning um, and also as a, a supporting mechanism for transition back to school. Um, fourthly, we, we know from our own experience in Australia that um, building a resilient um, remote or distance education um, system requires um, adopting a framework um, that transitions purposely from an emergency response model to a more sustainable model of education. And this relies on a framework-based approach um, that is um, 
underpinned by um, regulatory and professional standards such as teacher accreditation, student assessment and the national curriculum. And this is particularly relevant That's for countries that are susceptible to more frequent school disruptions due to natural disasters and conflict. Yeah, so sorry. in conclusion, I'm, I'm going to have you to stop there because the time is up. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that we'll have more questions and we would really appreciate if um, our participants, the audience, would be happy to write to Jung and Reiko in the chat now for further questions. But before oh, we have space for questions now, I'm sorry. We are having space, space for questions now. We have two questions from um, Natia from Georgia. So Natia asks, can you tell us more about the hybrid approach? What does it cover, the hybrid approach that you identified in your research? Shall I have a try first, Jung, and then I'll hand over to you. Uh, so my understanding, so a lot of our countries, particularly ones that have been going in and out of lockdowns have uh, really asked for, have been very interested in the hybrid kind of uh, learning methods. So it's really an ideal kind of learning uh, situation, I think, in that, so you have the option of uh, transitioning reasonably smoothly from face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to paper based or, uh, you know, being adaptable to those uh, low tech no tech or high tech uh, scenarios. So being adaptable to uh, whatever resources uh, students or teachers might have in, in their learning context. Um, Jung, did you have any thoughts about hybrid learning? No, I think you've captured it perfectly. Thanks, Reiko. Right, um, thank you. Would anyone have any more questions for Jung and Reiko? Well, I have a question to explore the time that we have. Um, you, it, the, the projects that you ran seem to be linked to international cooperation rather than to the education ministry. So how, how, were, how was this plan to launch a program to support um, the nearby, um, nearby countries? to face um, the COVID strategies coming from um, a international development goal, um, rather than we would be expecting coming from the Ministry of Education. Um, so I, I guess what we aim to do from the beginning in terms of the model is to promote a partnership model. So I think Reiko explained at the beginning that it wasn't about Australia um, importing our ideas into some of these countries. It was really um, generating the demand from these countries to look at what is relevant and what is contextually, um, what the gaps are basically, and where we can fit those gaps based on our own experiences. And to be honest, we, um, the Australian organisations were learning as well from these partners. And we were quite, um, so for example, in the Laos context, um, the Australian uh, Monash College didn't expect to have connectivity um, that was so smooth, run so smoothly. And so they had contingency plans in place um, so that they had they might have had to deliver without using a learning management platform. Um, but they were pleasantly surprised and they were also ple pleasantly surprised by the level of engagement of teachers in Laos and the, the amount of um, demand from teachers in Laos and teacher lecturers and trainers who were um, who wanted more upskilling in the area of um, using a learning management system because it was so foreign to them. They haven't had experience in that before. So we were guided by what the partners needed and we adapted the programming as we went along. I think, you know, that was very clear that it was a joint, it was a joint creation. It was very clear. It's just that the decision of creating a program a quick response 
in terms of cooperation as well, when everybody's trying to sort their own houses out. This is why I wanted to ask when, where, where the decision came from, but thank you so much for your answer. So thank you so much to Jung and Reiko. We know that you are in the middle of the night in Australia. So thank you so much for joining us, joining us today in the presentation. And we will be ready now to move on to our next speakers. Um, Denisa Alieva and Lilia Makovskaya from Uzbekistan. Yeah, I am here. Oh, right. Hi. Yeah. Hello. So you, you, you have noticed probably that I'm being very good with times, right? So I am giving a notice of five minutes by chat. So please, okay. please watch your chat because um, yeah. I don't usually like to do this, but I have to say, I'm sorry, you have to finish. Yeah, I um, see. Can right. I start sharing the screen? Yes, you can. Can everybody see? Yeah. Good. So thank you very much. So good afternoon or good evening. <coughs> I'm sorry, everyone. So today, uh, together with my colleague, Denisa Aliva, uh, I'm going to present uh, the findings of our study that we did for one of the courses that we all participated in. Actually, we did this together with some other colleagues um, who are Mamura Yusupova and Ozoda Turabova. So the course name was Feasibility Study of Scaling Innovation. And we actually chose online platform or let's call it an application, mobile application that is called EduMarket. So um, I would also like to say that Denisa is now teaching therefore she recorded her speech and I will try to stream it. And if it doesn't work, um, Jose Luis promised to help me with this. I hope everything will work well. So let me now explain what the purpose of this project was. So <coughs> Edu Market is an online application that can be downloaded for free. Um, the main uh, objectives of the projects were to make the process of learning and knowledge assimilation more convenient and interesting for school children. We know that the uh, children like using gadgets, right? And therefore it was very important uh, for the developers of the platform to make their learning uh, more interesting and engage them more. So another important thing was to create a transparent system for monitoring child's progress for parents and teachers. So sometimes and parents are angry, let's say, with the, um, the um, children when they are using gadgets too often. But this application would give them an opportunity to see if, how well they are progressing. So the next important thing was to build the right knowledge acquisition system for every age. So let me clarify here. EduMarket is a platform that um, was created for the school children. The first stage that we analyzed together with our team was focused on the primary school children. So the next stage, uh, <coughs> secondary school children um, is in the process of the development. So therefore we didn't analyze this for our project. And uh, the next one uh, was probably one of the most interesting for most of the children is to make the gadget not an entertainment tool, but a com an educational tool. So let me continue. Uh, the project started right before the pandemic. Actually, um, this was not in the minds of the Minister of Public Education of the Republic of Uzbekistan, but it was right in the time just right before the pandemic, and it's still continuing. As I said, in February 2020, the first part or stage um, was developed primarily for the primary school children. And later in 2020, uh, the second stage started. So uh, this part of the application was created for the school children of grade, from grade five to nine. So, the main focus of uh, the project and the platform was to focus on the children's development and the education through gamification uh, with the use of this application. Um, and uh, <coughs> they hoped uh, to have certain benefits for the children who will be involved in studying through the games, for the parents who will see that their uh, children are using them application for the purpose, for the good purpose, for the teachers who will be able to monitor the progress and development of their um, students and for the state, because the more knowledgeable people we have, of course, the better. 
So we try to analyze uh, the application to the theory of change. It was interesting to find out that uh, Edu market was um, very important for the country, was very important for the school children and for the school teachers. And therefore uh, it aimed to create opportunities for development and learning basic skills through the interactive games. So the platform is focused on several subjects which are taught in the primary schools and on the um, study skills which should be developed uh, at the primary level. So different kinds of activities were done in order to promote and make the platform uh, work throughout the country. So the first one uh, was um, um, <coughs> showing the demo version of the platform in one of the schools in Tashkent. After that, the trial was done in several other schools also located in Tashkent. So for those who don't know, Tashkent is the capital city of Uzbekistan. After that, the demonstration um, was shown in one of the international universities in Tashkent, which was the middle of um, February. Um, of course, the teachers um, the students and the authorities, educational authorities were invited to this meeting. And then later in summer 2020, there was an online contest among the school children who were actively using this platform. Several prizes were given to the students. Um, most of them, of course, um, so the first and the second and the third place um, was awarded with a um, gadget that can be used in order to use the application on a regular basis. So up to now, there are more than 200 um, downloads of these applications and there are not, not all of them are active users, but more than four, um, 40,000 are active users. It was interesting also to find out that um, the contest was uh, mostly popular among the <laughs> school children and actually more than tw uh, 20,000 children participated in this contest. So there, was, there were several um, goals or outcomes that we observed throughout uh, our analysis of the platform and um, the whole, let's say, process of adaptation to the program and using this online application. So the first outcome or goal was um, a growing interest to learning among the primary school children. We also have found uh, that there was a further development of digital approach to teaching and learning. And as I said, it was just in time during the pandemic. And we hope that the long-term uh, goal for the platform developers was an increased level of school uh, children's development and the development <coughs> of their skills. I'm sorry. And as I said, the main mission of the platform that was created by the ministry and the developers is to improve ch children's development and their learning through gamification. Let me now move on to the next part. And this part is going to be presented by Denisa. I will now try to stream it. I hope it will work well. And as I said, if it doesn't, then Jose Luis will hopefully help. Please let me know if you can hear it. Interpreter cannot hear anything. I, I don't think it has started yet. Um, I actually did. You did? But yes, I did. Maybe I can try to screen share on mine. Let me see if it yes, works. Uh, I will stop mine. Okay. Thank you very much. Let yeah, I see. did. Let me see if it works better in mine. Let me see. Yeah, probably it does. Okay. I mean, directly from yours. Thank you very much, Lilia. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Denisa, and I will continue starting from this point. I would like to share with you some information regarding methods that we were using in order to evaluate some. Can you make it louder, please, for interpreter? Uh, um, basically, we used two methods data collection. We did a survey uh, by internet that we sent to parents and we sent to school teachers. Um, 107 parents answered on the survey, and uh, the survey included some questions where we were asking them to talk to their children and then 
provide us the answer. So we are including here the children as well. And our 56 school teachers gave us some ideas and some comments regarding what they thought about the market. Uh, in addition, uh, several interviews were conducted. Um, we had six representatives of the Department of Content, the Ministry of Public Education that developed the, the project. We had four employees of marketing and sales department of two private internet companies with whom we talked about the current situation with internet and telecommunication in Uzbekistan. Then uh, two employees from private mobile companies and one representative of the World Bank office in Uzbekistan. Um, we have seen that the edu market provides, of course, some innovations. First of all, we have the possibility that we give to children to learn independently and to develop this sense of responsibility. In addition, of course, as it was proven by many studies, communication is quite important. So it helps us to ease the learning process and it helps us to make the memorization and training less boring for children. And of course, what we have noticed and what our participants um, in our study also noted is that the soft skills, soft skills development by edu market platform is crucial. And this is something that they cannot find, for example, in program of um, ordinary public schools. So these are, of course, the positive parts of the project. However, um, we have seen some possible modifications that might be implemented in the project scale. For example, we have seen that uh, the marketability or the private project is not quite good because uh, even the target audience is determined, still the promotion is weak and still there is a need to do more and more work on it. So what we provide, uh, what we suggest to do is of course to conduct um, more effective campaign of promotion and to increase the awareness, not just among the teachers, but also among the parents using different methods of communication. Uh, then, of course, regarding the resources that are needed for usage, um, our participants and our interviewees reported that in the Republic we still have internet connection problems and the high cost of mobile internet um, is not something that really can be a positive feature of the project. So what we suggest is to develop an offline modification that people can download and people can use. Then we have our operational feasibility, and we see that the project covers the need of children who are the main beneficiaries of it. Uh, however, what we may be advised is to correlate and integrate games into the school program. So there will be no uh, clash and no, um, no, let's say, bad connection between what the market is suggesting and what schools are doing. And then, of course, technical feasibility. We have seen that teachers are almost not involved in the creation of the program and the private companies are not participating. However, if we involve their participation, we can modify the edu market platform in a quite progressive way. So uh, to summarize, uh, what we would like to recommend is of course to develop the offline version of the platform that can be used even in the remote areas where internet is quite weak to involve more primary school teachers who really work directly with um, school children and who know what exactly they need and to create more efficient promo campaign that can provide information about the market to beneficiaries in the whole republic and not just to particular groups. So uh, this is it. This is all what we wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much for your attention.
and have a nice day. Thank okay. you very much for screening. So that's all, Eleandra. We okay. have finished. Thank you very much. We try to make it short. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. So thank you so much, Lilian and Denise. I haven't seen Denise though. Yeah. As I told you at the beginning, she's mm -hmm. having a class right now. That's why oh. she recorded her presentation. Oh, and yeah. I asked Jose Luis to stream it because okay. I couldn't do this directly, unfortunately. No, it's okay. It's no problem. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you very much for understanding. Thank you. And um, so do we have any questions for Lilian and Denise or for Lilian now? Yeah, or? I will try to answer the questions. <laughs> she, would do the <laughs> she would do double jobs today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's okay. Yeah. We are colleagues, so we should support each other. Oh, very nice. Very nice. So in, in the meantime, while we wait for questions, I have one question because yes, when you mm -hmm. talk about um, having an, an offline platform, yes, mm -hmm. it requires. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's my time. <laughs> yes, now we, now we, we are good. Um, when we have offline platforms mm -hmm. it also requires an amount of technical support in order to make the offline to update with the online when it connects so in your project are you also forcing all this the, this technical background or the technical work that happens behind the curtains to make Thank such you. a project to, to work in reach yeah. out to different areas. I see your point. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, you know, when we started analyzing the project, I mean, the application, we noticed that sometimes it requires some update. And then when it required the, an update, um, the pupils, <coughs> sorry, were not able to use it properly. Mm -hmm. And actually when it required the updates, it had to take several megabytes, which as we say, takes a lot of time and money because the parents will have to pay for all these updates themselves, right? I mean, to pay for the megabytes to make it downloadable. So therefore we thought that an offline version uh, that uh, we are not technical people, so we are not IT specialists, but we suggested that probably there is, an, there is an opportunity to create an offline version that will not require so many updates or that can be done, let's say, on a regular basis, probably once in two months or something like this, but they will not require being online all the time. Otherwise, as our colleagues from Georgia mentioned, in some remote areas, we also have problems with the internet connection and the children will not have an opportunity to develop and to even play um, these educational games in comparison to those who live in the cities. Yeah, no, very interesting. The reason I ask, it's yeah. because it might be a good opportunity to connect with the technical colleges, the students who are doing vocational education now. Mm -hmm. And part of their training is to make sure that all this programming or writing codes or whatever you call it, because I mm -hmm. am also not technological, to make this work. So I thought that this could... Um, such a project similar to what Maya and Nino spoke about, about Georgia earlier, that there seems to be in an ideal world where we think that everything works to have um, connections and collaborations with other sectors of the educational system. But I know that this is very theoretical. Things don't work that way in our countries. I'm also from a developing country and things don't usually work that way. But um, I, I think that there is so much potential that we, we shop for ideas and for help within our own educational systems, but perhaps with people that we never worked before. Yeah, so, thank you very much for the suggestion. Technical I problem. guess we'll, we'll, we will take this into consideration. Thank you very much. All right. And we will try to talk to the right people because we are personally not, not involved in that project. Yeah. We are just the people who are an analyzing, analyzing our disabilities. Right. Yeah, and if it can be scaled up or not. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you yes. very much again for your presentation. Yeah. We, we are going to move on now to our thank you very much. speaker. Thank you. And Leila Alma Gambetova.
will be um, um, speaking in Russian, right, Leila? Uh, uh, hello. Hi. Здравствуйте всем. Okay. So. Good afternoon to all. Um, you have. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to attend this conference. Can you hear me? Can it's a major chance yes. for our country, for our organization to present the unique experience of our work in conditions of the pandemic. So I will try to be concise and not to be criticized for that. So sharing the screen. Can you see it? Can you see it now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we think, think that in view of present global changes, some that some time should be devoted to distance learning. Video lessons have become an effective means of distance learning in parallel with other distance learning methods as we were teaching just in offline settings. Video lessons my, are based on multimedia. They are more interesting for students and become a popular means of popular of popular learning. Most teachers understand that this is an interactive way by making video records. It might be a video recording of an ordinary lecture or laboratory work with the presenting of the teachers uh, in difference to the streaming technique video tutorials pro can provide for the maximum volume of information and should take into account uh, the bulk of uh, different aspects we can i cannot launch the video Uh, quality video lessons. These are the, some of the samples of video tutorials. Well, there is it's not possible to to play it. Quality lessons should come should match some criteria, and they take into account uh, the uh, characteristics of modern students. Uh, and uh, young people are quite comfortable in this environment. The video lessons expand the information field of uh, learning. And it means that uh, video tutorials is easy to integrate into different virtual methods. It's very relevant for our country because we have very many small schools in remote villages where they don't have an opportunity to visit museums or have other resources. And because of these video tutorials, kids there can vis visit in such a way many such uh, places. Teachers, while creating such video tutorials, they create uh, the digital content, resources to be used, pupils, and so uh, students learn themselves to manage their learning activity. Also, so, uh, the, the, these video tutorials develop ICT competencies, the students' ability to work with large databases, and also how to dig information from big masses. Uh, for example, pedagogues in Kazakhstan were using uh, video tutorials placed on uh, platforms, video platforms. In particular, they used our uh, the educational channel of our company early, and we were developing um, tutorials and placing it on our platform. It's very important that video lessons, so people use just uh, uh, video tutorials created in advance. 
So we also conducted trainings for teachers how to create such video tutorials. So we were aiming uh, developing uh, skills of uh, uh, teachers. Uh, uh, either they use uh, material, the video content of other uh, uh, teachers or to develop their skills to uh, produce their own content, uh, video content but as well as such uh, video lessons might be used by other their colleagues to develop such uh, video tutorials. So we, uh, we were training our teachers that they should take into account psychological aspects. Uh, teachers should take into account the mindsets of, uh, of students, although they do not see them offline, but only they are online. But as a matter of fact, uh, these lessons, these tutorials might be used by other teachers as well. And uh, this content should match the uh, the needs for the learning and to take into account and develop such tasks that would involve uh, students. So not to uh, be boring for them trying to shut off the tutorials, that these are not lectures. Teachers should apply different interactive methods, methods of interactive teaching for students to be attentive. That is, they should define goals of the tutorials in view that tutorials are rather short uh, in length of uh, 10, 15 minutes. That's a uh, and so, our Orleo, our joint stock company, uh, in the times of distance learning, we use the educational channel. We have produced 7,000 digital tutorials which were developed in collaboration with the best teachers in Kazakhstan uh, in the grades from the first uh, from the first to the 11th grade and uh, were about many visits to these tutorials and it was considerably supported by Kazakhstan's pedagogues to develop such tutorials. Pedagogues use the following approaches. Of course, that's the matching of the content of the lesson to its topic and age features of students to take into account the uh, duration of uh, time, also to take into account resources from other sources, and also to income to embed uh, practical tasks that lessons should be of practical character to have also descriptive elements for the self-assessment by students and to also to have links to the external resources to expand the knowledge if uh, students would like to do that on their own. To devise such lessons, our um, teachers follow the following stages, that is to define goals, uh, methods, uh, to choose uh, practical tasks, and, uh, and by different methods. Of course, they were preparing a script as well as uh, uh, elaborated a design of an educational environment of a video tutorial. Then and they also will help them to choose uh, relevant software uh, like for creating uh, video tutorials. So uh, uh, different uh, softwares to, to used uh, to use it. Then we were all just analyzing the video content. And after the material was edited 
these these video tutorials were placed on our on our educational channel. Thus, uh, a video tutorial is an efficient training tool which allows pedagogues to provide uh, basic knowledge in remotely. And although in Kazakhstan now we are in off-light mode of uh, 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 teaching, that these video tutorials are of great interest. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I have completed my presentation. Oh, I see, Leila. Well, thank you very much. I didn't. Um, now I understand. They have, have you any questions? Yes, there might be questions. Do we have any questions for Leila? Nino? Do you have a question? My question is during uh, video tutorials, how, what about the feedback? Just uh, there was no. Uh, how about the feedback? How have you made the evaluation of the the input of the le of the lessons? These lessons were accessible for all students across Kaz Kazakhstan. So teachers uh, downloaded it from the platform, and then teachers download just. Uh, disseminated it in their class in their classes teachers worked used this content with their own classes uh were there any were there any problems with the evaluations uh, systems how to evaluate uh, the uh, participation of lessons no, mm, no there, there were no more amendments uh, to the uh, normative requirements but uh, that's uh, the most uh, the most difficult thing was to get accustomed to such a way of teaching. But in the course of two three months, uh, we have developed experience, and uh, 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 just uh, when we have developed uh, the, our experience, people started already uh, that they like they felt uh, missing it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Other questions? Um, for them, for the questioning, does anyone have any more questions for Leila? Well, if not, I would invite you, that if you remember a question for Leila, please send her a message, a direct message on the chat as well. And uh, we can then move on to our next and final presenter, which is Garen Avanesian. Um, so Garen, um, you will have, as everyone else, you have 15 minutes to present and five minutes for questions later. So um, please, the floor is yours and you can um, share your screen if you want as well. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, introducing and uh, happy to be here today with you. Let me share my screen. Um, you see the slides? I hope. Let me go to the presentation mode. Yeah. So. Hello again, my name is Garen Avanesian, Garen, Karen, whatever you prefer, uh, depending on the dialect of the language uh, that I'm coming from, of the uh, uh, nation that I'm coming from. But today I'm going to present the, um, the talk, Household Level Readiness for Remote Learning, Evidence for Mixed Data. So I work at UNICEF, uh, United Nations Children Fund in New York, and uh, what we do is basically we produce data for education advocacy. Um, in, in that regard, my, my talk is going to touch upon um, the things that are maybe, uh, th that are strongly related to digital learning and uh, connectivity, but still they rather provide uh, a global picture, which could complement, uh, I hope could complement these uh, great country level field experiences that we've been hearing throughout these 
this session. So, um, household level readiness for remote learning, evidence from mixed data. So maybe it makes sense to start with saying what is mixed and what means mixed data. Mixed is multiple indicator cluster survey that is um, carried out by UNICEF in uh, more than 60 um, lower and middle income countries and is used to inform progress on sustainable development goals in, 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 in many countries and um, monitor consideration on children and women. So right now, uh, well, some years ago, uh, in the education sector of data and analytics, we launched the initiative, which is called Mixed Eagle. Mixed Eagle means, means education analysis for global learning and equity, which functions under the KICS funding. And the project duration is for 36 months. And basically the evidence that I'm gonna present right now is the part of the work that we are doing on the Mixed Eagle um, uh, support of kids. Um, basically the whole idea of Mixed Eagle is to help countries to make better use of their educational data and use household surveys to produce the customized analysis. And the analysis is focused on eight major education topics which includes remote learning. So as you can see, the indicators, they tackle access and completion skills, inclusive education, early learning, and so on. And um, since the current pandemic, of course, introduced a uh, new number of challenges to global education and learning and equity, <clears throat> we thought that it's necessary to include the new topic, remote learning. The remote learning is a topic that basically um, basically is the newest one and looks at the household possessions, uh, possessions of the assets needed for, for a child to learn remote. A couple of words regarding the current socioeconomic context in which we all um, exist right now. A year ago, uh, uh, well, more than a year ago, in April uh, 2020, uh, on the onset of pandemics, uh, we all saw that more than one and a half billion students had their learning disrupted in almost 200 countries all over the world um, due to the fact that uh, governments closed the schools to contain the spread of the virus. But the thing is that even after 18 months since the pandemic was announced, our latest data says that 27% of the countries worldwide have kept schools fully or partially closed, which means that more than 130 million students in 11 countries missed at least three-fourths of all uh, in-person instruction time. About, we also know from the previous evidence, um, uh, the report that was published last year, it's called the Reachability Report uh, of UNICEF, that about 30% of school children worldwide are not able to learn remotely through any means. And large variations can be observed between countries, levels of education, and family socioeconomic status which means that children cannot work remotely because either they do not have any assets, such as no radio, no TV, no internet, or there is no policy designed for them to be able to access learning through a certain remote modality. With this regard, UNICEF is working to connect every child and young person to internet uh, through the World Plus Digital Learning Solutions by 2030, which is in line with the Reimagine Education Initiative. In addition to this, there is another joint initiative which is launched by together with UNESCO and World Bank and it's called Mission Recovery, which advocates for reopening schools and providing catch-up learning initiatives through digital technologies and teacher training for digital technologies as well. And since we all understand that end of the COVID-19 pandemic is not foreseeable, remote learning will continue to play an important role in delivering education in the near future also as a remedial tool to catch up on the lost learning during pandemic uh, to, to provide children who lost uh, learning or had their school time disrupted with opportunities to catch up. With this regards, we um, all basically, we are asked by, well, we, we face a very important question. How can we tell which part of remote learning systems should be improved to ensure continuous provision of education to all children in the country. This question basically sets up the major work that we are doing right now. It's called Remote Learning Readiness Index. We are working at UNICEF on this index, on this report, and it's gonna be 
it, it is planned to be released later on this month prior to G20 summit. And um, uh, basically it looks at uh, three key aspects of resilience of education system. The first one is household level factors, because we believe that it's important that the household level factors, such as possession of assets, are in place. Second is a policy capacity, policy response capacity of the ministries of education. And the third one is preparedness of education systems for emergencies and crises. It needs to be mentioned that the nature of these three key components is not substitute, which means that um, performance, high performance in one domain cannot compensate for the lower performance in another domain, because you cannot ensure that remote learning system works if you have high household, possess high household possessions, but there is no policy that basically provides learning per se, and so on. But this talk, I would like to focus on the first domain, household domain, because for producing household domain, we use mixed data, we use household survey data, and we analyze it. And that is exactly what we observe at the demand side, which means that on the side of children who are learning and their families who try to support their learning. So when we talk about household factors of readiness, we mean that uh, if a child has radio, television, mobile phone, internet, or computer at home, these are core pillars of the household level factors of the readiness for remote learning. With this regard, since this session is uh, dedicated to digital education, digital learning and teaching, uh, we also acknowledge for the fact that nothing but digital solutions can emulate classroom instruction best because they provide interaction between student and teacher, something that cannot be done through the broadcast channels such as radio and TV. But um, last December, we together with ITU released a report on digital connectivity, which basically showed how unequal and unequitable access to internet is. So basically, as you can see, when it comes to the school age children in three to 17 years old, only 33% of them globally can access internet from home. And uh, basically the number is way lower in low income countries where it accounts only 6% of school children who can access internet from home. And it peaks of course in high income countries where the prevalence still is not universal because we, we can say that even in high income countries at least 10% or more than 10% of school children cannot access uh, internet from home. Uh, yeah. The disparities, they are also present when we look at the regional discrepancies and uh, we see that countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa regions and in uh, North America, uh, sorry, and in South Asia are uh, basically just demonstrate the lowest connectivity rates. Um, and uh, in three regions, such as Latin America and Caribbean, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and East Asia and Pacific, at least 50% of children in school age can access internet from home when or if the schools are closed. Um, this chart tries to assess this relationship in a more complex manner. Basically, it's a scatter plot that confirms that uh, there is a strong downward trend between countries' economic development and share of school children without internet. In other words, digital connectivity is in many ways a function of countries' income, which means that digital channels cannot be used as equitable solution for, lo for learning in lower income countries because they cannot provide education to people in also in people, children in vulnerable backgrounds. Um, and the most meaningful challenge with this regards is of course um, disparity between urban and rural infrastructure. Because if you look at the global figures, then it's clear that while globally 41% of school children who live in urban areas can connect to internet from home to learn, only 25 children in rural areas can. So the disparity is the disparity is big, and it also varies across the regions. 
Um, interesting pattern here, I don't want to go into the technical details, but the lowest disparity is actually observed in the regions with overall low prevalence of internet connectivity among children. So with this regard, it means that we need to look at other devices, at other sources, such as TV or radio possessions. But, um, but, but even, even here, these charts uh, that you can see, they, they suggest that the access is also, despite the prevalence of TV or radio possessions, is way higher all over the world in the regions. The disparities still exist, and they, they, are, they are pretty wide in some regions, smaller in other ones, but it just puts a push, it just uh, kind of brings us again back to the problem that uh, there is no universal solution for equitable digital. It's very difficult to find a universal solution for equitable digital learning. And, um, yeah, but that is basically what, what is needed, what is needed to ensure equitable education, right? So with this regard, and maybe that's my last slide because I try to be quick. I understand that everybody is, um, uh, is, is tired, but, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, just the key messages that I wanted to single out is that low digital connectivity overall undermines the potential for children and young people to, to, to gain necessary skills and knowledge needed to succeed in the world that actually becomes increasingly digital, right? And um, lack of connectivity is a clear barrier to, uh, that will prevent children from, from accessing effective and interactive forms of learning. Uh, especially in the situation of the learning loss and recover from the learning loss. With this regards, efforts should be put to significantly expand digital access, acknowledging that connecting rural areas is the number one challenge. Um, but provision of catch-up learning through digital solutions would still play a key role in recovering education from the learning loss, even in the situation when the schools are back to in-person instruction. And the very last point, is that, of course, it's very important, but it's difficult but important to seek for the optimal solution of blended learning that could account for the fact that some children might lack necessary household possessions for them to be able to learn. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'm open for questions if there are any. Okay, well, thank you, thank you so much, Garen. And um, I have about 3,000 questions, but let's first hear from the audience. <laughs> um, again, can you please stop sharing your screen, if that's OK? Yeah. Um, would anyone have any questions um, for Karen? Can I start making my list of questions, please? <laughs> I hope I will be able to answer. <laughs> well, you must, now that you spoke about it on the presentation, you must. <laughs> No, you, right, you so I don't have number. many. I'm going to make one question because I understand that we also have a new session coming up after hours. I'm not really sure. No, is this the last the, the session? Oh, right. So I can make it my the last one. questions we can then. For, for how long we want. Look at that. <laughs> oh, let me warm my coffee then. So let's just stop. <laughs> no, my first question is, the, the project started from 2000, right? You mentioned that it started the Ego project, sorry, from 2000, mm -hmm. uh, 2020, I'm sorry. Correct. How did you get any country to run household survey during this time? Or are you using data prior to the pandemic? And how can you make assumptions about the pandemic with data prior to the pandemic? Yeah, and that's my that's nice a, question. <laughs> that's your nice question. That, that's a very good question. Uh, I am absolutely sure all your questions are nice. I hope that my answers would 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 be at the same level. Um, uh, so Mix is the household survey program that operates for many decades already, and right now it is on the Mix Six. It's the sixth round of the Mix program. So it was taking place disregarding, it's not linked to COVID, this data collection. And uh, in the sixth round, we introduced Eagle Initiative also before the pandemic, so that we understood that there is a strong need from the global community to, um, uh, to and, and this household data can be a potential source because it has a lot of education related variables to basically um, to help countries get better use of the data that they have. So that's why this initiative also includes capacity building exercises, national workshops or something. 
so of course, uh, uh, so right now when the COVID started, of course, mixed team, which is an absolutely separate team in UNICEF, they customized and they adapted some of the modalities on data collection, like there was a mixed link mm -hmm. uh, or other initiatives that, to be honest, I'm not aware very well, but if you, I'm, uh, it's because another team is doing it, I'm from the analysis part. Uh, but for our advocacy, we use both pre-COVID data and post-COVID data. I don't think that data, of course, when the when when there were lockdowns, no data no data collection was going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but I know that in some in some countries, I believe um, it's it's back or like the countries are. We still have uh, right. We still have some data that we collected before COVID. And the thing is, of course, the impact that we estimate is indirect. Uh, but when you measure a number of school children who have internet from home, you also need to expect that this number is not changing in one month or in one year or in two years. So the data that we collected on internet connectivity in 2018 is still valid for 2021 because the years, it, it takes years to expand digital infrastructure. Like, as I just told. And by looking at number of children connected to internet or in 2018 or to 2020, we still can understand, we still can estimate that okay. approximate number of those who are falling behind. I see, because in terms of the structure, it would be the same structure yeah. that would be existing before. But then when it comes to policy response, when you cross the data with the next aspect that you tell us that the RLRI project navigates through, the household policy responses and the educational system preparedness. When you get when you cross the data with the second one, you hit the wall because the policy responses will have to respond to the pandemic. That's true. Uh, I'm sorry due that to, to yeah, due to the lack of time, yeah, yeah, due to the lack of time, I didn't go into the detail of other parts uh, of the because we decided to focus. We were thinking to focus on mixed part household, but the index itself is based on three data sources. So for the policy response, we use a different data source, the joint survey carried out by UNESCO, UNICEF and World Bank, when we surveyed ministries of education on how they responded to the crisis by adopting remote learning policies, by providing training to teachers uh, and so on and so forth for every level of education. So kind of the index that will be going out later on this month will be a combination of three data sources mm -hmm. and a certain of approximation of where the country stands in terms of resilience of remote learning systems. Oh, I see. So thank you. I'm, I'm, I will going to stop here. I might send you an email. And I also have students who I want my students to look into this very soon to either support or analyze it because we, we work on education policy and international development. So I have a group of children that I really want them to focus on current projects, just like the one that you just presented now. And of course, I want my students to do comparative analysis, thinking of the cases that we just saw from Georgia, from Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan, from Australia. So it would be excellent to be in touch with everybody who presented. So thank you very much. And with this, we thank Gavin and we thank all of our speakers once again for sharing their experience and their, their, their research and their knowledge with us. Um, this will be the end of the session now. And, um, and we really thank you for, for your participation. I hope all presenters felt um, very welcome and felt that they had the chance to say everything they wanted, despite my timing, which was very tight. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you all. And um, this is the end of the session now. I think we can finish with the recording. And I want that Georgia wine. Where is that Georgia wine? <laughs> we'll Please send, send we'll me send the bottle. <laughs> Maya.